go. Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab, where the Loyalists are preparing for what could very easily prove to be a decisive blow. The second battle of the Sagan Naval Yards, the single most strategically important location in the entirety of the Autonomous Zone as it not only commands access to the most sable warp routes in and out of the Autonomous Zone, but also possesses vast naval facilities, allowing for the easy maintenance, resupply and refurbishment of warships. Its loss after brilliant maneuvering at the hands of the Tyrant was a severe blow to the then Cartagen Alliance, Damage that the new leader of the Loyalists' cause, Carab Cullen, would see wiped clean from the slate. But he knew, of course, that the tyrant would not let go of Sagan easily, and so he had mustered the single largest concentration of Loyalist arms ever seen so far. The Fire Angels in full chapter strength, the Red Scorpions and newly arrived Exorcists, along with elements of the Salamanders, Raptors and Nova Marines. Rare is the day, indeed, that elements of six chapters are focused on a single objective. But again, with the revelation of the tyrant's treachery, things had suddenly gotten a lot more serious in the Autonomous Zone. Furthermore, the Loyalists could see an advantage to be had. What had appeared to be a near unavoidable stalemate had been broken wide open by the sudden and ferocious intervention of the Minotaur's chapter, ravaging through the pale stars and liberating Vyarnia alongside the Red Scorpions. What had seemed to be a conflict in near perfect equilibrium had suddenly turned quite decisively in the Loyalists' favour. But the tyrant was already reshuffling the deck, moving his astral claws in unknown quantity around the board, trying to counter the moves of the Minotaurs, and the executioners had already proven themselves capable of the task. If the loyalists were to turn temporary advantage into a permanent one, this was the time to do it. But it would not be an easy task. Luft Huron, the once almighty tyrant of Badab, sat on his throne in the Palace of Thorns, staring intently at a holographic projection of his beleaguered empire. A mere two to three years ago, he was at the cusp of winning it all, reaffirming his secession with blood and violence, forging himself an empire within an empire. Not an impossible dream either, mind you. There are several little independent nations, states, kingdoms, feudal societies that exist within the Imperium. As we have already talked about, there are planets within the Autonomous Zone that are de facto independent and left to their own wills and wishes so long as they pay the Imperium's tithes. Huron may very well have been able to broker such an arrangement with the Imperium, had it not been for his many enemies in lofty positions, and his own sins upon which they eventually stumbled. And perhaps, even if he could not broker arrangement, if he was allowed to build up his strength, then he could maybe be a prickly enough hedgehog to be left alone. But there too, his plans had fallen somewhat short of the mark. At the height of his power, he had commanded perhaps as many as 5,000 Space Marines. But the venture with the Black Templars into the Maelstrom Warp Storm Zone had seen that number greatly diminished. Years upon years of warfare had further cut it down in the conflict with Cartago and the Firehawks, and three further years of war with half a dozen Loyalist Astartes chapters. Well, 
Let's just say that Huron was getting dangerously close to becoming Codex compliant once more, whether he wished it or not. Of almost equal worry was the position of his allies. The Mantis warriors still stood strong, but with Sagan threatened and Sorengrad in loyalist hands, they were at risk of being cut off from the Badab system. And the Lamenters... <laughs> well, the fate of the Lamenters is well known. They had suffered harshly in the war up until this point, and now, being almost the sole recipient of the Minotaur's attention, Huron could not be sure for how much longer he could rely on their aid. And what of his more conventional forces then? The Tyrant's Legion had proven remarkably apt at their role, yet, unfortunately, much like the Astral Claws themselves, um, they had now been engaged in near unceasing warfare for close to a decade, against vicious foes as well, and on two fronts, fighting off repeated incursions from within the Maelstrom, Boulder and Boulder pirate raids and orc wargs, along with fighting the Firehawks, the Carthagen Alliance, and now fresh loyalist troops as well. And despite the Legion performing head and shoulders above anything that could be expected even from seasoned Imperial Guard regiments as they fought the Red Scorpions at Vyarnia, a decade of warfare it takes its toll once more. The Tyrant's Legion was starting to run out of seasoned veteran personnel, and was beginning to scrape the barrel, with fresh-faced 17-year-old kids filling its ranks where once veterans of lengthy service stood. And the Maelstrom Squadron was faring even worse. The Loyalists had access to literally infinite replacements of warships, of men, of Astartes chapters, of ordnance, of supply. A Maelstrom Autonomous Zone? Not quite so much. Every vessel it lost was a literally irreplaceable commodity. The Sacred Tetrarch, but one of the many invaluable warships that had fallen over the course of the conflict. And so, the unwelcome spectre of military math once again rears its ugly head, as the tyrant was beginning to realize that whilst victory had long since been given up on, now even a hope of a negotiated peace was beginning to look mighty unlikely. Not since the failed venture with the Black Templars into the Maelstrom Warp Storm Zone had the Tyrant's servant seen the man in quite such a mood as he locked himself away in the Palace of Thorns, spending innumerable hours simply staring at the tactical progressions, trying to find some way out of his corner. Meanwhile, the Loyalist fleets broke upon the Sagan system. Considerable orbital defense assets, including orbital platforms, have been put in place by the Tyrant, alongside substantial Legion forces and Maelstrom squadrons as well. The Nova Marines, Raptors, and Salamanders provided assault specialists, leading the charge with their battle barges, hammering aside any and all enemy resistance, the tip of the spear, to be followed in by the Red Scorpions, Fire Angels, Exorcists, and Imperial Navy forces as well. Split aside by the initial result, the orbital defenses and the naval assets of the secessionists fought a scattered, desperate withdrawal action from Sagan, engaging first and suffering at the hands of the Adeptus Astartes, but luckily for the secessionists, they had another objective, the planet itself. 
The rest became a bloody, brutal, drawn-out conflict with Maelstrom squadron forces fighting Imperial Navy and Battlefleet Solar Reserves. And their much reduced numbers notwithstanding, the Maelstrom squadron once again proved itself the equal, and indeed in many cases the superior, of the Imperial Navy forces and even a vaunted Battlefleet Solar Reserves of Carab Cullen inflicting heavy casualties upon them, but slowly in turn being driven to the edges of the system, completely unable to interfere as the Astartes landed on the planet itself. With the Fire Angels present in full chapter strength leading the charge. Though in an unusual fashion, the Tyrant's Legion had taught the Loyalists many an expensive lesson during the raids against Vyarnia. The Red Scorpions had been furbished with the Inquisition's own intelligence, naming the Legion nothing more than second-line auxiliary troops, PDF equivalents of little if indeed any real notice. They had proven themselves far beyond that, fighting with a discipline and organization that would shame even most Imperial Guard regiments, and worse, the Tyrant took no heed of the Imperium's ban of mixed regiments. Phalanxes of Lehman Russ battle tanks trundled forward alongside swarms of Chimera armored personnel carriers unleashing platoons of heavily armed Tyrant's Legion infantry, amply equipped with heavy bolters, autocannons, and stubbers, weapons that proved lethal even against the God Empress Astartes, and all the while supported by heavy artillery barrages laid down by bombards and basilisks directed in from the front lines. This massed battle doctrine had proven effective beyond all expectations against the Red Scorpions, who engaged the Tyrant's Legion as if they were exactly what they had been told that they were. Poorly trained and ill-disciplined PDF troops to be scattered by a mailed fist driven directly towards them. It requires incredible bravery and thorough training for mere mortals to stand tall, proud, and resist in the face of space marines. And yet, when the Tyrant Legion did just that, the Red Scorpions found themselves beneath a withering hail of fire, bracketed by heavy artillery and shelled by tanks. This was not a foe that the Loyalists could afford to engage in such traditional set-piece battles. Instead, the Fire Angels moved to get in amongst the Tyrant's Legion, leaping out from the assault ramps of Thunderhawks, passing over the battlefield at breakneck speed, or hammering in amongst their lines in drop pods. They then scattered, forming smaller combat teams or moving as individuals, relying on their ability to maneuver through any terrain at high speed, and their vastly superior individual firepower and martial prowess. Single Fire Angels descended upon entire squads of Tyrant's Legion, slaughtering them in mere seconds with bolt, pistol, and close combat weapons. Larger combat squads enticed columns of Lehman Russ battle tanks and APCs into difficult terrains before jumping on top of them and slapping melter charges on top of their hulls, scouring the insides with bursts of bolt of fire and promethium flame. As the heavy support elements of the Tyrant's Legion seek in vain for clear targets unobstructed by their own men and vehicles, Basilisks attempt to lay down supporting barrages only to catch perhaps a single Space Marine in their fire, one running at high speed and clear of the bracket within seconds. No juicy targets present themselves, allowing the Fire Angels to pick apart the Tyrant's Legion tank by tank, squad by squad. As soon, the rest of the Loyalists might descend in amongst them, in pre-cleared areas now free of intervening artillery and heavy armor. And with their landing secured, the balance of power tilted drastically in the Loyalists' favor. 
The secessionists had hoped to deny landing, or at the very least impart heavy cost on the enemy as they made landfall. But with the Fire Angel's successful skirmishing, they were now able to join up in serried ranks alongside the Red Scorpions and the Exorcists as they drove towards the primary fortification on Sagan, the hub of all command and control, without which the enemy would be reduced to scattered bands, incapable of common cause. Such a vital objective was obviously heavily guarded by both Tyrant's Legion forces and the Astral Claws that yet remained on the planet. But to bind down as many of their forces as possible, the Salamanders, Raptors and Nova Marines would carry out diversionary attacks across the planet against Tyrant's Legion barracks, against reinforcement columns, against other areas of command infrastructure and the naval dockyards above, in an effort to divert attention away from the main thrust. The advantage of the Space Marine always being speed, of course, and the ability to turn swiftly. A thousand superhuman warriors reacting much more quickly than any army of a million mere mortals. This advantage, however, also lay with the opposition. Lufthuron had reckoned that Sagan would be attacked with overwhelming force. His only real hope that the Tyrant Legion be able to once again outperform their previous stellar reputation. But the Loyalists had, as we had already talked about, learned many a lesson from Vyanya, and the Legion was not quite what it had once been. Its opposition was lessened greatly by the efforts of the Fire Angels, and now they stood against not one chapter, not two, nor three, but six chapters, along with Imperial Guard and Navy support elements. In such a situation, very few, if any, mortal armies would have any hope of success whatsoever. And having accounted for this, the Tyrant chose to go with a somewhat more desperate ploy. He reckoned that the primary command and control center would be the Loyalists' main objective, and had concentrated his own astral claws nearby in a gambit, the success of which might just see the Loyalists' fortune of war reversed and them repulsed from Sagan, and the failure of which would at the very least inflict substantial casualties on those who tried to test Lufthuron's domain. It was a roll of the dice of last resort, however, and first conventional means of resistance would be attempted. But with the Fire Angel scattered deployment and the severe casualties suffered by the Tyrant's Legion, now bereft of their primary weapons, their discipline, organization, along with heavy arms, armor, and artillery, their resistance was swiftly coming to an end. The Astral Claws themselves, ensconced in protective positions around their headquarters, found themselves without support, and vastly outnumbered. As the Fire Angels that had previously been scattered across a large battlefield now coalesced in front of the Astral Claws positions. As Red Scorpions and Exorcists formed up on either flank, the Fire Angels became the solid center that pressed its advantage into the Astral Claws positions. This may very well have been a brutal meat grinder, a deadly conflict to be sure, but with salamanders, nova marines and raptors still present in orbit above the battlefield, the loyalists had complete void and ground superiority. Every position held by the Astral Claws swiftly found itself bracketed by heavy weaponry, or flanked by orbital deployed combat teams from the aforementioned chapter. It became clear that a defensive position would only see the Astral Claws garrison defeated in detail. One squad at a time, one bunker bust open, one blockhouse blown apart from orbital land strikes, or scoured with frag grenades and Promethean bursts from flamers. The Astral Claws' main strength. Their fortifications, their bunkers, their pillboxes, their prepared positions themselves had become their weakness, and would swiftly become their grave unless something was done. 
measure of last resort, swiftly becoming the only one possible. Falling back quickly, the Astral Claws reorganized and mounted up into several rhino-born combat squads, led by whatever armor was left to the Tyrant's Legion, and then set off in a spearhead assault towards the enemy, with a handful of rhinos racing ahead of the rest. An armored personnel carrier filled with ten angels of death is a quantity of lethality rarely matched in the galaxy, but today was the exception that proved the rule. As the rhinos leading the charge were not intend to disgorge astral claws into the enemy's mists, but instead to deliver several viral warheads. Secured from Luft Huron's considerable arsenal of exterminatus grade weaponry. This was to be the ploy to break the Loyalists' lines and allow the Astral Claws free reign in their enemies' flanks and rear. As long as the Fire Angels could be broken, the battle could yet be turned to the secessionists' favor, and they reckoned that the deployment of half a dozen virus warheads should do the trick nicely. Now these were not the full Life Eater virus, mind you. The deployment of even a single such warhead would risk turning the entire planet into a world swept clean of all life and reduced to biological goop as the virus would eventually turn upon itself. It was a much reduced version, but nevertheless potent enough to wipe clean all life in a dozen kilometers in any direction, even that wearing power armor. But even as the warheads detonated, uh, the secessionists quickly learned that they had underestimated their opponents. The Astral Claws had expected their opposition to turn, to flee, to scatter away from the impact site, horrified at the massive casualties of having these weapons delivered directly into their midst. Then the Astral Claws would speed through at maximum velocity, passing through the viral clouds before it could do real damage to the rhinos and descend upon the enemy's rearward lines. Instead, the Fire Angels not only did not scatter, they drove straight forwards into the teeth of the Astral Claws, forcing them to break and deploy their own combat squad or be flanked and destroyed at point-blank range by crack missiles and melter charges. Even as the air filters on their helmets began to be eaten away by the virus, even as the fiber bundled muscles in their joints and their waist was also similarly devoured, the Fire Angels refused to give ground, preferring to stand and die where they were rather than see their lines broken by the Astral Claws, who now found themselves embroiled in the same virulent soup that they had unleashed upon their enemies. Withdrawing back towards their bunker complexes after a mere hour of combat, the secessionists suicidal counterattack had ended in dismal failure. Most of their force wiped out and the entirety of what remained of the tyrant's legion that they yet commanded either scattered in horror at seeing their comrades reduced to nutrient goop or they were the goop themselves. Before the secessionists could reorganize themselves for any further attempts at mobile warfare, they were completely surrounded and hemmed in. The salamanders, nova marines, and raptors had landed in full strength, moving in from their other strategic objectives to lend aid to the red scorpions, the exorcists, and what remained of the fire angels. Secessionists had succeeded in something, however, as Loyalist Command standing by in orbit was horrified at what had just occurred. Obviously, the Astral Claws had been declared excommunicatus traitoris, and such actions should perhaps not come as a surprise, but again, up until this point, it had been a relatively sedated war. The brutalities of the Minotaurs were on the other end of the Autonomous Zone, and even then that was viewed as distasteful at the very best. 
The commanders of the Nova Marines and Raptors contingent in particular expressed absolute horrified surprise at this turn of event. The Astral Claws, a mere half decade ago, remained one of the most respected and valued chapters in the Imperium, trusted friends and now reduced to suicide tactics to break a cordon that Nova Marines and Raptors themselves were part of. But they were now completely surrounded. It would take days to winkle out all that remained of Astral Claw's resistance deep within their fortified positions, but they were not allowed to mount any major operation again, as Thunderhawks and air superiority elements constantly overflew their remaining positions in the industrialized zones, and squads took on fortification by fortification, paying a steep price in Astarte's blood for each one, the Fire Angels in particular, which refused orders to withdraw from the field. But at long last, the final Astral Claw drew his last breath in the depths of a bunker complex hidden deep beneath the industrial zone, a brother's blood still wet on his sword. And victory was declared. The Loyalists had seized the Sagan system back and with it, stable warp routes deep into secessionist held territory. But the victory was grander still than that, with Sagan under their control and with Surngrad now able to be fully reinforced and joined into the Loyalist cause. Badab stood completely isolated from the Endymion Cluster, and with it, the Mantis Warriors. I imagine the shattering of much furniture happened when this news arrived on Badab Primaris, and Lufthuron saw his mini-empire shrink yet again. And this time, not in a mere voluminous term, but with severe strategic consequences. A third of his warders removed from his grasp, and access to the stable warp lanes around Sagan in and out of secessionist space along with it. We will never know just how much faith Huron had in his last ditch gamble upon Sagan. Maybe he expected it to have succeeded and there was ample opportunity for it to do just so. If the Fire Angels had truly been broken, and the Astral Claws had happened upon the flanks and rear of the Red Scorpions, and the Exorcists, catastrophic damage may very well have been done, perhaps even enough to see the remaining chapters withdraw from the endeavor altogether. But to Carab Cullen's joy, that had not happened. Though the Fire Angels would never fight in a frontline capacity in the war for Badav ever again. They had suffered devastating casualties, losing more brothers in a question of hours on Sagan than they had so far in the entire campaign, reducing their chapter to as little as a third of original strength. No further would be risked in the campaign, and they would be retired to garrison and supporting duties henceforth. And the casualties didn't end there either, though death was not the reason why Carab Cullen would have to say farewell to three of the chapters that fought under his command. The Nova Marines, Raptors, and Howling Griffins all withdrew from the conflict after Sagan. Not necessarily of their own choosing, however. Legate Inquisitor Jandice Frain requested audience with his Lord Militant in the days after the glorious victory on Sagan. That in and of itself was mighty unusual as the Legate Inquisitor was not the kind of man to ask another's permission. He was far more of the kind of man to just be standing on your balcony one day with no sign of entry. And that really told Carab Cullen all he needed to know. 
Bad news it was then, he thought, as he pressed his signet ring to mark the official acceptance of the Legate Inquisitor's request. Frayne, of course, opened proceedings by congratulating Carab Cullen for his brilliant victory at the Sagan system and the seizure of the naval yards mostly intact. This surely would be the turning point of the war. From now on, it would only be tightening the grasp around the secessionist traitors' necks. Though, on that point, the Inquisitor felt a certain sense of misgiving. Really, uh, he brought up the reactions of the Nova Marines and the Raptors chapter masters um, to the Astral Claw's suicide assault on Sagan that brought the Fire Angel such tragic casualties. The Legate Inquisitor were worried that perhaps some of these chapters were softening a little at the thought of what needed to be done here. He, of course, did not question their commitment and their understanding that they were fighting excommunicated traitors. And he would never go so far as to suggest that they might have some form of sympathy with the traitors, with the secessionists. <laughs> of course not. He merely said that it was not necessary for them to stay any longer. A vital, irreversible strategic advantage had been seized with Sagan, and he could see other chapters step up to take the place of the Nova Marines, of the Raptors, and the Howling Griffins, much reduced at the hands of the Executioners. In fact, Legate Inquisitor Frayne himself reassured Carab Cullen that he had taken every step necessary to make absolutely certain that Cullen's war efforts would not suffer in the slightest by the removal of these three chapters. In fact, Fresh replacements and reinforcements, Space Marines were already on the way. The Exorcists pledged new companies, as did the Sons of Medusa, whose original complement had just returned from the looting of Signax, with hordes heavy with interesting baubles and trinkets. Uh, the Star Phantoms as well, a personal recommendation by Legate Inquisitor John Dice Frayne sent glorious news that they too would lend their aid to the Inquisition's purposes in the Badab sector. Oh, apologies. The Imperium's purposes, of course. Oh, and uh, on a similar point, there has been some green skin incursions in nearby Ultima Segmentum as of late. Uh, perhaps the Salamanders would care to intervene there in uh, greater numbers? I'm sure we can spare you here in the Autonomous Zone. The Legate tried to the stony-faced expression of the Salamanders battle captain stood beside Carib Cullen. His red-orbed eyes staring down at the much smaller man, not offering so much as a word in response. Though from his craggy exterior, the Legate Inquisitor surmised that his answer was, No, no, no. Don't worry about us. We'll uh, <laughs> hang around. After all, who knows where the tyrant got all of those exterminators grade weaponry from, hmm? We wouldn't want you to misplace any further of those now, would we? And so the Salamanders stayed, despite much pressure to see them ousted, alongside the Nova Marines, Raptors, and Howling Griffins. Quite the shift in power, this. Not in the war, but um, in Imperial politics. The Legate Inquisitor had managed to replace most of the chapters that were considered to be less than pliant, as the term goes, and replaced them with the Exorcists, a chapter with a long history tied to the Inquisition. The Star Phantoms, considered outsiders by the other chapters, and the Sons of Medusa, so recently indebted to the Legate Inquisitor himself. 
Carob Cullen must have felt a bit like he was the victim of a military coup at this point. Even those elements of Battlefleet Solar that had served with him since the beginning were mysteriously recalled to deal with a supposed orc incursion in the Ultima Segmentum that had rather suddenly grown far more threatening than previously estimated. It feels as if the Inquisitor was sending a message. Yes. Carab Cullen, you are still the military leader of this expedition, but I am the leader of this endeavor. An implied statement that rubbed both Carab Cullen and Captain Pelas Mirsan of the Salamanders very much so the wrong way. And they put rebellious heads together to plan a little bit of an upset for the Inquisitor. But. That is going to have to wait until next week, because we are approaching a chapter of the story now that absolutely deserves its very own entire video. And it includes, of course, The Lamenters. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.